Okay, it's four o'clock, so uh, let's uh, let's get going. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for coming, those of you who, who are in the room, and the rest of you who are listening in or watching where, wherever in the world you happen to you happen to be. Marianne Sin and myself will will the guide you through or run you through uh, our views on, on, on Swedish monetary policy, what's happening in the rest of the world, uh, what's going on in the Swedish economy and what that implies when it comes to where we are presently uh, setting, the, setting the policy, the policy rate. Uh, uh, starting then with the monetary policy uh, update, one could wonder why does it say update, by the way, because we've, we've, we've used this language by now for a long time, but it refers actually to the, to the monetary policy report that we published in, 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 in February, and this is an update because this document is shorter than the, than the report itself. But if you, ha if you take a close look at it, you'll actually find that it's getting longer and longer over time. So, so I think we have to think hard eventually about beheading here, but it doesn't really matter when it comes to deciding things, we, since regardless of the name, we have to decide something once every two months. That's, that's basically the, the way it works. So uh, this time we concluded, uh, and pretty much actually in, in, in line with uh, our, our reflections and what we said in, in February, that as far as we can judge, there is a gradual recovery in the economy. Uh, coming from what's going on in the rest of the world, but also actually from what's going on in the Swedish, uh, Swedish economy, and not the least given the debate we had in the latter half of, of, of last year about what the third quarter was going to be and the, the fourth quarter and, 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 and all, of, all, all of that. But so far, things uh, seem to be moving um, reasonably well in the direction that we have envisaged, while at the same time, uh, this happens against the backdrop of uh, low inflation, so we have uh, revised our inflation forecast, and I'll get back to that uh, later. And in that environment, uh, we came to the conclusion this time that uh, it's a reasonable thing to stay put at 1%, uh, but on the other hand, given that the upturn uh, is on the slow side, it also makes sense to push interest rate uh, hikes further into the future. Compared, compared to the way we looked at it uh, the last time we, uh, we, uh, we met. So now we're talking about moving up the policy rate towards the end of 20, 2014. Uh, this uh, view uh, comes from the fact that the global economy is improving. Uh, the global economy, if you look at gro global growth numbers, uh, doesn't look all that bad after, after all because the emerging markets, they continue to grow. Uh, the Americans are working their way out of their problems. So they've been dealing with that now for a number of years, but if you look at the growth numbers only, uh, they, they actually look quite, uh, quite reasonable. And then, of course, at the other end of the spectrum, and that affects us, we have the euro area and all the issues that they try to deal with the, within, uh, within, uh, within the euro area. And there are basically two parts to it. One is the the struggle they have with the financial sector, trying to get it to work again. And the other part is all these structural adjustments that will, will have to take place in one form or the other in different parts of, of, of the EM, EMU, and that holds particularly for, for southern, southern Europe. And uh, one way of looking at it is to say that part of that adjustment process actually, in terms of what you do and how, how it evolves over time, looks a little bit like, uh, like uh, what we had to go through in the 90s. I mean, the Times are different, but, but in terms of the basic building blocks and the, the parts that you deal with, it's, it's not, that, not that dissimilar, except the fact that, that, that they have a fixed exchange rate within, within the region itself. And then all thing, adding all things up, looking at the key IAC kicks, the, 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 the trade-weighted uh, uh, trade GDP number here, it's not surprising that it would end up somewhere in between or up towards the U.S. Uh, side, given the composition of, um, of, uh, of Swedish trade. And then you get a, you, you get a growth uh, path, which is um, kind of traditional in the sense that we're moving towards uh, something which is, looks normal, normal to us, uh, something that we, can, that we can recognize. On the slow side presently, but growth will pick up. It takes a while, but eventually we will, we will get there. And uh, the Swedish economy, as we said already in, 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 in February, is uh, starting to thaw. And one way of looking at 
at this is to, to look at the, the confidence indicators. And as you can see here, looking at the uh, corporate sector and uh, households, uh, they are now on the in positive uh, territory uh, both. And, and uh, that's a good sign in itself. At the same time, consumption and, 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 and purchases and things like that have looked a little bit better than we expected. And as all of you know, also the, the third, uh, fourth quarter numbers were actually higher li at the end of last year compared to what many, many, many expected when we discussed that, discussed that issue. And this uh, gives a picture where GDP growth will uh, gradually rise over the, o over the year or actually over the, o over the years to, uh, to come. So eventually we g we'll get up to the long run average 2.2 and then above average given that global growth and particularly growth then in the U Euro era will, will gradually pick up and things will, things will uh, norm uh, normalize. And uh, when you look at this uh, from a labor market perspective, uh, then our view is that uh, both the employment rate and the un unemployment rate will stay fairly flat where we are in the course of this year. And then uh, empl the employment rate will slowly start climbing and the unemployment rate will start falling. When, I, when we talk about this, uh, it, as a, just as a reminder, then in our projections here, projection here, we have factored in the revision of the data. Uh, so this is actually the new, the new time series that we, that, that we present. And, and the reason for us still being at 8.1, 8.2 is, is basically because the unemployment numbers have come in a little bit better than, than what we have expected in the, in, 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 in the past. And this is the reason why these graphs are so, so similar if you were to compare February and, uh, and what, we have, what we have now. Uh, since, uh, since our uh, conversation in February, many people have uh, commented on, reflected on, discussed the exchange rate. And uh, if you take a long-term time perspective and if you look at the real exchange rate, we are now at a level which we have actually seen and many times before. And in that sense, there is nothing extraordinary about the exchange rate uh, presently if you include price increases in different parts, uh, different parts of the world. And, 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 and this is also why we are uh, quite uh, comfortable uh, with the present level, level of the exchange rate. Uh, despite the fact that many have argued that, that the, the corona has increased, uh, has uh, appreciated and appreciated a lot. And that's, of course, the, the, the case if your starting point is one, something close to 145. Uh, but then one needs to be mindful of the fact that that peak is highly, highly unusual. And that also presented very, very unusual economic conditions. So, so when things uh, normalized, and in, at least in our view, we're now in, in, in a reasonable territory. And when you translate that into the nominal exchange rate, and here looking at it in, in terms of nominal kicks, then as you can see here, our projection is that the exchange rate should, should stay fairly, fairly flat. But having said that, we know that it's uh, very difficult to, to make precise exchange rate uh, projections. But, uh, we think that this is a reasonable projection, and we also do think that the exchange rate is at, as, is at a, a reasonable level, uh, given what's going on at home and given what's going on in the rest of the in the rest of the world. And then, uh, all things considered, when you look at inflationary pressures, uh, given that uh, the exchange rate for, in, in, over, a pa over the past few years has appreciated. And given that aggregate demand has been on the low side, that has created a si situation where there are low inflationary pressures in the economy. And that means that CPIF is hovering around 1% and then will gradually go up towards uh, 2%. And at the same time, given that we're carrying with us the, the interest rate reduction from 2% to 1%, that also then pushes down the CPI, C CPI to, to around uh, 1%. And then, as always, given the, the, the mechanics of, of, of these two indices, uh, uh, when inflation picks up, that means that the pol policy rate eventually will go up, and then, of course, uh, the CPI will overshoot our 2% inflation, inflation target, because that's the way the system, the system works. Now, uh, this time, uh, we have also revised our inflation forecast. Uh, 
and we came to the conclusion this time that it's likely to take a longer time than we thought in the past until the inflation rate reaches its 2% uh, level. And as you can see here, if you compare the blue graph with the red graph, uh, you can see that, that, that we have uh, uh, made a revision uh, downwards. And there are two, two reasons for that. One is, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the, the exchange rate which, uh, of course, then creates a situation where we don't get really much price pressure uh, on, the, on the import side. And that holds particularly if you look at goods, not so much services, but particularly goods. And, and then, uh, then the other part is that if you look at uh, uh, how to pass on uh, cost increases to, to consumers uh, in the past year or so, Despite the fact that uh, price increases on uh, and 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 the cost of the unit, u the despite the fact that unit labor costs have been around two percent, uh, this hasn't actually been passed on to uh, uh, to to end uh, and 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 buyers. And as you can see here, if you have a CPIF hovering around one percent, then then something has happened in the system at least uh, at least for now. While at the same time, it's reasonable to think that eventually this will, this will change and these costs will be passed on to, to, to consumers. But for that to happen, then aggregate demand would need to increase. Uh, and eventually, when that, when that happens, being it either abroad or domestically, then inflation, the inflation will pick up. And, and that's a very, very natural consequence of, um, of how, how higher growth uh, uh, going, going forward. Uh, and that means that uh, looking at it from a monetary policy uh, perspective then, uh, given that it will take uh, longer before uh, price uh, increases will come, uh, we also find it reasonable to, to push the interest rate path uh, to, the, to the right, or we can choose your words or downward depending on where you stand and how you, how, how you look at it. And that's then essentially saying that uh, presently we have a very low uh, policy rate. Uh, uh, monetary policy is expansionary, and it will take until the latter part of uh, 2014 before things will gradually, gradually start uh, normalizing, because by then also the growth numbers, both domestically and abroad, are such that it's likely to, to push up uh, prices. But another issue that we have discussed at some, some length this time is, is the whole issue of household debt, and here expressed in the form of the uh, debt to disposable income income ratio. This can, of course, be described in many different, different ways. Uh, the reason for, for the red graph there is that if um, households uh, um, are more positive now, they are likely to increase consumption, but also likely to borrow more and buy more houses. At the same time, the supply of housing is very low, and that means that uh, prices can only basically go in, in one direction, and that is, uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that's up. And th this is also then one issue that, that matters this time, and, and uh, taking that into account, uh, uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, all things considered, uh, the interest rate path that's um, that's in before you here is uh, represents a well bal balanced monetary uh, monetary policy. Uh, having said that, when you start talking about debt and debt levels, one needs to be mindful of the fact that these are these are slow slow moving slow moving uh, matters. So one issue is to think about this in the short run and then sort of think about what does it mean in the long run and what would the cost to society be? If we were end up, if we were to end up with a serious, serious problem in the, in the in, in the housing market, and by now a good number of countries have unfortunately learned the hard way that uh, to, to to uh, get yourself out of those problems will take years, and it's a difficult process. And during that process, you are quite likely to end up with very low growth, and also a very low inflation. So. So if that were to happen, then we would uh, most likely go off target uh, at, some, at some future date. And in order to stabilize this, then, then it would be, I think, a reasonable thing to find a, a set of measures, not only the policy rate, to, to make sure that we can stabilize this. And as you are aware, there is a lively, lively debate about that. But at the same time,
uh, we shouldn't fool ourselves thinking that uh, there is some unknown measure out there that w which is, so to speak, for free, because uh, all the other measures make it more expensive to borrow in one way or the other, and in that sense it's just another way of increasing the interest rate. So the name of the game is really to find a reasonable balance here in such a way that, uh, that the situation over time uh, stabilizes. But as always, uh, uh, the policy rate is a forecast, it's not a promise, and if things were to improve, let's say in, 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 in the US, in the rest of the world, or, or, or actually remar uh, would rapidly improve in Europe, which is not likely, then of course aggregate demand would go up, that means more inflation and the policy hike, policy rate hikes would come sooner rather than later. On the other hand, uh, that we have said now for several years, everything we do here is done against the backdrop, backdrop of what is going on within the EMU. And that's, uh, that's hard to judge. Our baseline scenario is that things will improve in Europe as well, but it will be a slow process. If, some, if something completely different were to happen because uh, it gets more difficult there, then that would of course also affect us. And then that would most likely then uh, push down the policy rate uh, as, uh, as well. But uh, this is the best, uh, the best estimate and our best judgment as of today. Uh, that's the, the red dotted line there in the, in the middle. And now Marianne, you'll say a few, few, few more words about where we are. Okay. So I'm going to take a, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the, re the revised inflation forecast. Um, but just uh, stepping back a little bit, m most of the new information since the February report uh, have been in line with the forecast we made then. Uh, but there are some revisions in, in, in the update nonetheless, and the most important one to, is, is, is probably the, the revision to the, the inflation forecast. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides uh, about that. And here you can see, you, uh, Stefano already showed this graph, but you can see the old forecast and the new forecast. And uh, the difference in 2014, for example, is, is 0.4. Uh, point 0.4 percentage points. This is CPIF. And so wh why, why have we revised the inflation forecast? <coughs> and again, I'm repeating a, a little bit of what Stefan has already mentioned. But one, one factor is that we have a stronger krona uh, in the forecast going forward. So if you compare the old Krona forecast with the new, you will see that it's on a stronger level. It's, it's flat, but it's on a stronger level uh, than it was in the February report. So that's one reason why the inflation forecast has been, uh, been revised. Another and, and, and very important reason is that we see we've made a new assessment of the relationship between cost pressures and, uh, and how that feeds into uh, consumer prices. Um, and where does that come from, uh, that new assessment? Well, we continuously look at our forecasts, obviously, in, in particular our inflation forecasts. We do that six times per year, so we always have a, a careful look at how uh, inflation is determined by a, a host of factors. But we also produced a report recently, it's called Account of Monetary Policy. This is an annual report that we provide to the Parliament. And uh, this was published about uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, it, used, it used to have another name, but now it's not known as Account of Monetary Policy. And what we did in that report was go back and uh, look at last year. And we learned some, we, we, we learned some important lessons when, when we did that. Um, so, um, and the, one of the themes in, in that report is that inflation last year came in lower than ta target, but it also came in lower than the forecasts that we had made in 2010, 11, and 12. So obviously our forecasts were, were not accurate. Um, this, is a, this is a figure that we have in the, uh, in the report, Account of Monetary Policy, and it shows our forecasts for CPI F inflation 2012. Uh, our forecasts from the beginning of 2011 all through 2012. So th there are six uh, red uh, squares. That's, they are our, our forecasts. And then the blue diamonds are other forecasters. And, and as you can see, uh, there was a tendency for all to overestimate the final outcome. 
that final outcome was about 1%. Um, one, one important thing is also that yeah, from this crap, you can see that the, the Riks Bank forecasts are not systematically worse than others. So yes, we did overestimate inflation in 2012 in our previous forecast for 2012, but we were in good company, so to speak. Now the question we ask in that report is why did the forecasts turn out to be wrong? And when we go back and look at the forecasts we made in 2010, 11 and 12, uh, for example, one, one important thing was that in the international demand turned out to be weaker than we had expected in 2010 and 11. Uh, you had lower import prices, partly because of the appreciation of the corona, but also because of uh, lower import prices in, in foreign currency. And then last but not least, uh, we saw this, um, uh, it was harder for firms to pass on uh, uh, costs to final, to final uh, consumer prices. And, and that, that, that analysis we have also brought into our, our new forecast. So my final, uh, my final graph is this one. So this shows on the one hand cost pressures in the form of, uh, of uh, um, uh, unit labor costs. That's the blue line and it's been smoothed by an HP filter. And then you have the consumer prices in the red line, which is CPIF here. And you see there's, I mean, there's a nice correspondence in the long term here between the, the cost pressures and, 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 uh, and consumer prices. That it is passed on to, 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 to consumers, obviously, because it has nowhere else to go. Um, but you can also see that in 2012, uh, the uh, f consumer prices were much lower than than, than what the normal relationship would suggest. And we, we attribute that to lower, lower demand, uh, more competition. It's tougher for firms to pass on uh, costs to, to consumers. And we also expect this to, to, to be the case going forward in 2013 and 14, perhaps. But eventually, these relationships they, they must hold in the long run. Also an important factor is that the krona is not expected to appreciate anymore. So that's why the red line it goes up, up to and above the blue line. And that's why we expect inflation to return to target. But that's, that's, that, that's the bottom line, why we've revised the inflation forecast. Mm? So uh, and then to summarize, uh, as I started out saying, we see uh, and, and and, and uh, in the course of the day, there has been a lot of discussions about the economy in, 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 in seasonal or climate terms. And, mm -hmm. and uh, starting from 2015, one can say that by 2015, we'll have an economic summer. Uh, but <laughs> it will take a while to get there. And in that sense, our forecast isn't that different compared to many other, mm -hmm. other forecasts. But in order then to support uh, Our is actually getting to that uh, to to that economic summer. Uh, then it's reasonable to keep the policy rate at one percent for the time, uh, for the time uh, being, in in order to support the recovery. And then eventually the rate will start going up sometime towards the end of 2014. While at the same time uh, we keep an eye on what what happens in the in the housing market. So I'll stop there. Yeah. Um. So we will have a REIT rate which will be uh, this level for 2013 and most of 2014. Um, what kind of considerations do you do when you weigh uh, such a REIT rate path to, uh, versus, for example, further cuts and then a quicker normalization? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, sure. I mean, if, if you just do the numbers, you can, you can in, 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 in a way, you can sort of produce the the same, the same re result in numbers terms by picking many different, yeah. d different because paths. Because it's the area under the uh, Yeah, uh, right, but then, then it gets sort of very, very technical. But in the end, uh, all things considered, this is a good one, the one we have chosen. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have chosen. Pardon? Uh, sorry. Is it obvious that this is less risky when it comes to building up uh, imbalances than uh, doing what Hendrik said? Uh, cutting it more now and then increasing it. Uh, well, it's better to do it. It's better to do it this way because the more, the the more, 
hyperactive you end up later, the more difficult it gets. I mean, so if, if I were to buy a house today, I might um, increase my loan even more, uh, thinking about it being this low for a long period of time, uh, then I would consider a 25 BPs extra today. Okay, everything in, this is, everything in this, of course, at the end of the day is a judgment, ju judgment call, because okay. we just simply don't, don't know. But let me add that part of this conversation is also to, to kind of um, make the point that we can't do this alone. Something else also has to be has to be done, and, and there, at least in my view, we've been, we've been on the slow side uh, when it comes to <coughs> taking taking other uh, other measures. Eventually, that's going to have to happen one way or the other, because otherwise, we end up on a on a debt level which is just way too high. And, and we, uh, we know, unfortunately, that in, in other countries, that to get that to go down, then that takes years. So, another way of thinking about this is to say that okay, we're talking about monetary policy here in, 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 in sort of cyclical terms, but one could also say that the other issue when we talk about debt, that's a kind of a debt cycle. And those cycles are slow and they're hard to, hard to, de hard to deal with. And, and then the issue is how not to over, overdo it. Uh, so uh, you had revised up the debt levels a bit mm -hmm. since the last report, mm -hmm. and uh, what I understood was uh, one of the reasons were the lower repayment rate, I guess. But uh, it's difficult to see in the graphs here. But uh, it's difficult to say whether um, the repayment now is uh, higher or lower in real terms versus the previous report. I see that in the graph it seems like that we have uh, they. Uh, cut each other the graph, so we have a higher real rate now, and then it will shift in 2014 or so. Okay, right. So, uh, but uh, yeah, the, sure. the question is, is it real or nominal? But then you, are, then you are really, then you are really, really, really into the decimals of this. Uh, generally, yeah. generally speaking, yes. the real the real rate is very low, either zero or or, or, or negative. Mm. And that then, of course, depends on what kind of an inflation projection you do. And, and how you combine that with with a repo rate path, and, and then you let, basically you end up somewhere between zero and minus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's the real uh, interest rate that uh, affects the models. But I'm going to come back to to the uh, forecast for the for the debt ratio and and um, the reason why 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 it has a upward sloping. It's not just monetary policy that it, that is. Mm -hmm. It's part of the general picture of where mm -hmm. housing. House prices are coming in. Mm. Outcomes are higher than than expected, mm. and and they, they the, the forecast is, is 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 rising, and that's going to bring about rising uh, nominal debts, and and uh, so that's an important reason why that why that traje trajectory projection has been been re revised up. Mm. Going back to the inflation and, and the discussion. And your new assessment regarding uh, how companies can pass on cost increases to consumers. Uh, since uh, the February report and your February rate decision, what kind of new information have you, have you taken into account? Uh, for instance, the company survey, has that been an important input for you? Or can you mention something more? Should, should I continue on that? Yeah. Because uh, um, as I said earlier, I mean, we, we do try to make full assessments of our inflation forecasts every every time but perhaps this time we've had an extra good look and 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 and, and put into it lo uh, many of the insights from the, the the report that I mentioned the assessment of monetary policy and we asked ourselves what why why weren't these cost pressures being being uh, passed on the company survey that you mentioned is definitely one one of one of the, of the that 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 can sort of that lends support to our interpretation that it is harder for firms to pass on costs. Um, so, um, but but it is um, it's a new assessment. Uh, no, the hard data. I mean, our inflation the, the inflation outcomes have been in line with our our forecast on on a month by month basis. But but the but this is so this is something that we've um, 
we, we looked at it from a longer term perspective and, and came to a new assessment. I mean, this is a gradual process. It's not that we were sitting around waiting for one more number and saying, <laughs> okay, if that happens, then, then we'll revise the whole thing. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't work that way because essentially we're talking about something that has accumulated over some time. Mm -hmm. And, and I think uh, Marianne's point is, is, is an important one here when, when, when she says that, well, we have done the revision despite the fact that what we did in the past seemed to be okay in the sense that uh, the numbers that we have observed lately have been uh, reasonably in line with uh, what we did earlier. Um, Can I just add just uh, uh, one more thing on, on that theme and, and that we we do use a lot of, of models, and of course we, we, we've had that also in the background here. Um, so th our models are also telling us that it was pr prudent and, and wise to revise down the inflation forecast. But we that knew was not the new, new results from the model, or was it? We, we've made a very comprehensive model of evaluation exercise, and and this was and this was part, but it was it was part of the picture. So ma many many pictures, many pieces of in this in this puzzle that we that we laid. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment the revision of the unemployment series? Mm -hmm. Has it affected potential levels? Do you, is it the same? Um, you had previously said that you said that you have a midpoint of six point twenty five yeah. or so in. Um, Neutral uh, level is that? That's still the same. So mm -hmm. we haven't revised that range and range, and by 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 definition and by consequence, we haven't revised the midpoint either. Um, so the unemployment so gap is more open now. Uh, that's after. That's uh, that's a figure I don't have in my head. Perhaps one of my colleagues can can comment on that. But but coming back to the to the unemployment forecast, I mean the history was revised upwards. On the other hand, the outcomes we have two two we have January and February since the February report, and they were on on the positive side. So that you will see that if you, if you compare the old and the new unemployment forecast, they look very much alike. But it's because of two opposing opposing forces here. So we still have unemployment uh, topping at 8.2 later in the year. Mm -hmm. And this is why it looks mm. as if nothing happened, mm. despite the fact that the time series was revised, mm. because you have two, two counteracting, yeah. counteracting forces yeah. there, and that's why well, there is such a small difference when you look at the graph that we had in, in February and that, the one that we have now. Mm. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the ex exchange rate. Um, you were talking about the real exchange rate not being that strong. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you consider the um, uh, history. Uh, but I think uh, the main point I want to make is that usually I, get, I guess we're used to having a weak uh, krona when we have a downturn like this. So when you sort of like um, um, cleanse it for uh, the cycle, mm -hmm. I guess you should still say that it's quite strong. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, I'm just curious if you, uh, if it would continue to appreciate from this point on, uh, how much would it have to appreciate for you to get worried? That's very, very hard to answer that question because then that would depend on what happens in the rest of the world and also in the Swedish economy. Since it's, it's, I mean, I very often get questions of the type, if A happens, would you, would that imply that B changes by this and that? And uh, in, in, in real life, when you have to decide, the world is usually much, much more complicated than that. So at the end of the day, if the corona were to, to move a lot, either up or down doesn't really matter. Then at some juncture, we would have to think hard about that, what it means in terms of Inflation and, and, and aggregate demand, and decide or decide what whether it matters ma matters or not. But but for that to happen, the move would need to be substantial and lasting. And uh, what is lasting when it comes to the exchange rate? That's hard to answer. I guess you sort of. Um I mean, when you make your alternative scenarios, you usually make the same exercise. You say that if they stay, in, for example, I think it was a year ago, maybe more. February last year, I think you had uh, an alternative scenario when you um, 
had an appreciating yeah, right right I mean, so I mean it's it's natural that yeah. you think about this sort yeah, of thing yeah, it's, it's part of our it's part of our work and if you go back to the 90s then then, then we tried for a while but then tried to use uh, what, what what is called the monetary condition index kind of a weighted mm. thing of weighing the exchange rate and and and, and the policy rate but it was hard to use because the policy rate we decide ourselves at given moments in time and then the, the exchange rate movements were just simply so random. So in the end we basically dropped it and, and said very hard to predict the exchange rate. If it moves a lot when that day comes then we'll, we'll deal with it as best as we can. That's, that's where we are. I can see a little bit of a target conflict here. I mean, for 20 years now, we've been uh, inflation targeting from the Riggs Bank, and this is widely anchored now in the society, and you can see that contracts are built upon them. And by addressing a, a serious problem like the, the indebtedness, uh, and maybe not the REAP rate is the ultimate tool for fixing that, it, could it be a behavioral change if people start to, to anticipate that inflation is not the only target? No, I don't, think, I don't think so, because the, the issue is really about what time frame we're talking about. Because if you, if you, if you say that the world ends after two years, then of course with that perspective the debt level doesn't really matter. But if you say that there is also life after two years, then we do know that if things go wrong, then that becomes a serious problem. And when that happens, then we're really going to go off target when it comes to the inflation target. And then kind of a, along a timeline, the issue becomes how to weigh one against the, one against the other. Let me use a very different, different example, but, but uh, which, uh, uh, which is a similar process. If you think about those days when we had a fixed exchange rate, and then basically, it's a long time, a time ago now, but if you think about what happened in the, in, in the 70s and the 80s was that we said, okay, fiscal policy deals with aggregate demand, fine, and every, every time you do that, you borrow some more, and then you sort of hope that, uh, that uh, once, eventually when the good times are back, you'll, you'll pay back the debt. That never happens. So gradually, marginally, time and time again, you end up adding to the debt until you end up with the government debt to GDP at such a level that you run the risk of what we call fiscal dominance. So it becomes harder and harder actually to conduct monetary policy. Now if you take a long view, then we're actually talking about a process which is fairly similar in the sense that if you're every time you say, okay, based on that, we have put fiscal policy over here uh, because we don't want that to happen again, so let's, uh, let's keep that at a government at a low level. And then you say, okay, every time there is an issue when it comes to aggregate demand, you should do something on the monetary policy side, fine. But when you do that, if every time the, the, the policy rate goes down, you actually add to debt, then you can say that each marginal decision doesn't really matter that much, but over 10 years or 20 years it does, and then you run the risk of eventually ending up in a similar situation where you get expressed in very general terms what I call debt dominance. And once that happens, then you are stuck. And then inflation targeting the way we know it also is, is hard, to, hard to deal with in that, in, in, in that environment. So given that we are where we are, we try to balance this kind of along a, long, a, long, a timeline, but that doesn't, absolutely does not change the, uh, the idea uh, behind inflation targeting, nor does it uh, change the in inflation target uh, in, uh, in itself. At the same time, I'm the first one to say that it would be enormously helpful for us if, if we could get a better uh, handle on this, on this by essentially uh, increasing the supply of, supply of housing and in various ways when it comes to dealing with these issues uh, within the, uh, the financial sector, one way or the other, increase the cost of debt for, for households. Uh, 
and that you do by, for example, amortize, amortizing more, or which, a which is a political issue, uh, by, for example, reducing um, interest rate uh, deductibility when, uh, when you pay taxes. But if it doesn't happen on that, on, on that side, then more and more will be pushed towards us, and then somebody has to put a kind of a band-aid on this thing. Uh, but it, it doesn't really, over time, solve the, 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 the disequilibrium issue, because we do have a disequilibrium problem there uh, that needs to be dealt with. And that disequilibrium pr problem in its different parts uh, goes uh, way, way beyond uh, monetary policy. Can I, can, I, can I just add on that note? But, but I think it's important. I mean, this debate is important, but um, just look at the inflation forecast. Okay, here it is. I mean, the basic elements of inflation targeting is still there. Uh, the, uh, the repo rate is set such that the inflation forecast goes to target. And, and it's here it takes a little bit longer than it, it used to, but, but for the reasons that we've explained. And the repo rate is very, very low, very, very low. We have a negative real, uh, real interest rate. And, and so, so it's very low in order to see, guarantee, or, or, or try to push inflation back, back to target and to lend support to the real e economy, including uh, the unemployment problem. So, they, so the basic elements of inflation targeting are, are still there. But then there is this issue of, of household indebtedness, which is, which is very, very difficult. Well, lovely <coughs> enough, we're in a position where, where interest rate still matters. If you look around in the world, uh, interest rate level doesn't matter that much because of the uh, debt dominance mm. you were talking about. Yeah, well, that, would, that is, of course, what one would like to avoid because one major difference between us and, and, let's say, a number of countries within the EMU is that what we are trying to deal with is to avoid getting a serious problem. What they deal with is trying to get out of a serious problem. So in that sense, their situation is, 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 is different. And that also matters if one looks at not the policy rate, what, what people actually pay when they borrow. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it from that angle, then actually what you pay in Sweden is very, very much comparable to what you pay in, 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 in the better functioning countries in Europe. And if you sort of move down south, then actually credit is much, much cheaper here because in many instances, down, down in, in, in the southern parts of Europe, either uh, the borrowing rate is high or people can't borrow at all because the banking sector is simply not, uh, si simply not functioning. And sometimes that kind of, sometimes we talk about these things as if we talk about an evolutionary process which is uh, identical uh, between where we are and where they are, and that's not the case. Well, it's still, um, uh, even though it seems like a detailed uh, question, but, uh, but you said that uh, we have a well-balanced monetary policy, mm -hmm. which of course you say, but um, if we have an unemployment gap that closes in 2016, mm -hmm. uh, at, at the same time when CPIF is roughly close to 2%, that is, um, <coughs> everything is lower uh, for the whole forecast rise, w w w then w what is the definition of a well-balanced monetary policy? Is it that we must have an in infinity length or uh, for a very long horizon or and also is it possible to uh, is it uh, possible to quantify in some way how much it, it can uh, we can um, induce in cost to take into account for example in debtness or house prices how, how much far we can go from within the forecast horizon from the target variables. Well, not, in, not, 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 not today in modeling terms. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if, if we could work that out. That doesn't, on the, on the other hand, in the end, in the, in, in the real world, uncertainty, uncertainty increases and increases a lot when it comes to projections after a year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. And that means that if you talk about uh, low probability but very high cost events in the future, it's hard to put a number put a number on them. So part of it is really basically what kind of a risk aversion you have in society mm -hmm. and what kind of outcomes you really would like to uh, like to avoid. I, I do think though that eventually we can we can we, we, we will eventually we will get there in the sense that we can we can sort of 
do the numbers. Uh, whether that is a meaningful exercise or not, uh, uh, time, will, uh, time will tell. But, but within the definition of well-balanced monetary policy, you must add the element uh, given your risk preference towards indebtedness. Right, but I guess. But that's why we have that. This, this is how you, how you design things. It's not a, it's not a mechanical, it's not a mechanical exercise, mm -hmm. and the world changes uh, constantly. And then you try to do as best as you can to, 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 to get to, to, to two percent in a reasonable way. So um, and just uh, finally, that is, if we assume that we wouldn't have any uh, worries about uh, anything about the indebtedness, assume that we had low levels, then given today's forecast with unemployment that closes the gap 2016 uh, as well as inflation, then would you say that we would have a balanced monetary policy today? Hard to tell. That's a hypothetical okay. question. <laughs> Let me ask another type of detailed question, mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, regarding the labor market again here. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a rather positive view about uh, unemployment and uh, employment uh, going forward. Uh, one thing I uh, often consider is that we, in several institutions and forecast institutes are, uh, in, in recent years have uh, underestimated labor force growth. And my question today to you is that despite the improved growth and improved uh, employment next year and going forward, you have a slower growth for the labor force compared with uh, uh, this year. Mm -hmm. um, can you evolve that, uh, mm -hmm. your, your view and, and the risk that uh, the labor force might continue to surprise on the upside? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here I wish I had my labor market experts with me. Uh, but you're right. We have been surprised on the on the upside here when it comes to to, to the supply lab, labor supply, but it's 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 not going to increase as quickly uh, going going forward. But um, but that's that's a risk factor um, in in in, the, in our outlook. Uh, you said that we deviated from other forecasters. Yes, we do have a, a, a different picture compared to the government, for example. Mm. They they have a much more pessimistic view, but here we sort of rely on old historical relationships uh, between, in particular, uh, growth and, and, uh, and the un unemployment, and this is, this is where we end up. But there's enormous uncertainty here in, in, in this field, and that's, for example, I mean, that's one why, one, one reason we, we do have this range for, for the long-term unemployment. Uh, the middle is 6.25, but we but the range is between 5 and 7.5. 7.5 is, 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 is in that range. Um, but I'll have to get back to you on, on, on more deep thoughts on, on the labor force uh, projections. I mean, they're hard. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. following up question mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. is perhaps that you haven't <coughs> mentioned the, the wage, uh, wage uh, development here. Mm -hmm. Uh, despite you have reduced it a little bit, mm -hmm. slightly, uh, because you, you have a slightly positive assessment from the wage agreement we have seen so far. Mm -hmm. But perhaps you have, um, in my opinion, you are quite cons conservative here. Is it that uh, the unemployment going down so quick you, that you expect uh, a little bit higher wage drift going forward in 2014, 2015? Mm -hmm. Or why do you still believe in a 3.5% wage increase in 2015? But that's a pretty normal relationship between, mm -hmm. w between the, what's been agreed and then the final outcome. Uh, so, so I don't think there's anything do you mean given today's labor market or an average? Well, because you could assume that the wage drift should be quite low or modest these days, perhaps. Or Again, uh, these, are, these are sort of the average of mm -hmm. average uh, relationship between, uh, what's the term, uh, the, the negotiated uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and the final. I'm, I'm, not the 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 I'm not the technician. <laughs> I'm not the technician here, but, but there are no... As, as far as I'm aware, there are no extraordinary or different assumptions here compared to what we 
normally what we normally use when we when we look at look look, look at the labor labor market right 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 or wrong. I mean the really really tricky issue is a different one, and that is that if you look at un the unemployment rate in the Swedish economy over the past 10, 15 years, then the issue is one of matching, and one of whether the unemployment rate actually on average is different is is drifting upwards. And how one would uh, go about dealing uh, dealing with this with that? What we can do is is, is by moving the policy rate up and down, uh, make these adjustments uh, through through the cycle uh, easier. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of other issues going on there at the same time, uh, which are hard to deal with, and, and and they're way outside what we deal with. Just a quick follow up question to that: You said that uh, unemployment is trending upwards. Um, or it has been. Mm. Uh, but if we had had a much lower uh, growth in, in the labor force, we would have had, uh, of course, a much lower unemployment rate. So is that really a bad thing? I mean, these people no, are Good question. To really, yeah, good. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a highly, highly relevant question because there is another conversation which is also completely outside monetary policy about the size of the labor force and the, the, the good thing about belonging to the labor force compared to not belonging to the labor force. So in, 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 in that sense, it's, it, it's, it's, not a, it, it's not a given. And what we tried this time, given that, that we have both graphs, uh, both the uh, employment rate and the unemployment rate in the same, on the same slide, is basically to say, well, it's, a, it's an oversimplification to only look, at, uh, only look at unemployment, because if the labor force actually for various reasons starts to shrink because people just don't think that they belong there, then you have all sorts of other other problems. Yeah, know. and the other way around, even if you have a, an increasing employment, you could have had an even faster increase in employment if you'd gotten these people in. Sure, uh, sure. That's available, available to yeah, the labor market. Right. So, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. No, 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 these, these are very, very difficult, very, very difficult issues, but there, there are others dealing with them. It's not, it's not for us. Okay, more questions, reflections on this? If not, uh, once again, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks a lot for, for discussing together with us uh, where we are, where we're heading. And also thank you for those of you who have been uh, watching and, and listening in, wherever you happen to be in the world. And uh, uh, see you again in a, little, in a little bit more than two months. Thanks.